Welcome back to So Bad It's Good, presented by Betches Media. This is great today. I got actually introduced to this podcaster in this podcast through our dear friend, Sophie Ross. And I think this is kind of perfect to talk about because we talk about pop culture, but as we talk about in pop culture, that it, it, it takes you down all of these like kind of lonely roads or little highways or little kind of like tentacles of an octopus that you have to pay attention to, to kind of understand where we've gotten to with pop culture today. And uh, I have been fascinated with this and the business behind the industry of TV, film, music. That's as fascinating to me as uh, the shows or the music that I listen to. It's just as fascinating. Just unfortunately, it's not covered nearly as much. Now, our guest today, she is a co-host of this podcast, um, but uh, you know, uh, it just really is something that I need you guys to add to your podcasting queue. You are not going to regret it. The podcast is called Corporate Gossip, and it explores the most absurd corporate scandals, the juiciest Wall Street tea, and the not-so-hidden secrets of famous business people. You don't need to know anything about business to enjoy the Corporate Gossip podcast, but you might learn something along the way, as they say. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, for the first time, Becca Platsky. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Ryan. And I love So Bad It's Good. And I also wanted to tell you, I just love your and Sophie's don't dynamic. Mondays are like my favorite day. I love listening to you she's guys. Like, she's like turned into my. She's turned into like my sister in a lot of ways. Where it's uh, it's so loose. It is, you know, like it's just great to have that kind of relationship over years. Where I like, I can just, I love that she can just go off and rant, and then I can be like, like a doofus. And she always has like a different perspective, and she goes so much harder than I do. Where I'm like, hell yeah, it's she's she's great. Well, so you know my. Uh, podcast is hosted by me and my brother. So I love yes. the brother sister dynamic and I totally pick up on it on you guys. It's great. Well, before we get into like the content, how did you and your brother come to like, first off, it's like hats off to anybody that starts a podcast, but why start a podcast about corporations and CEOs and these people behind the scenes? What got you fascinated or started on that route? I think that my brother and I are genetically predisposed to be interested in, in this stuff. So our dad is a business journalist from a local paper in upstate New York, and he'd been doing that for 40 years. And our mom is a therapist. So you kind of combine these two things where we understand business and we also understand that there are human beings making these decisions, not often because of synergy, but also often because they want to one up their business rival yeah. or they have... In a lot of our podcast episodes, we talk about these CEOs who have kind of childhood trauma that they never went to a therapist. And so now what they're doing is they're trying to fill that hole with money and fill it with power. Um, so we kind of grew up talking about not necessarily corporate gossip, but topics topics that relate to... This is my first time using this mic and it is not... You know oh, what? I, I have by the way, I, I've used that it. mic before. I've used that mic before. So I was like, yeah, you got to tighten it on the side. Okay. Uh, That's Ryan, how little I three, know about hardware. 324, we can edit that. Um, uh, so you grew up talking about all of these things, not corporate gossip, but like business. Exactly. And so this podcast, like any good podcast does, started as a TikTok. And then I realized <laughs> I need more than 60 seconds to talk about some of this stuff. And I was so lucky. My fiance at the time was working at or was running a podcast studio. So I just went in and started chatting and then it we kind of went from there. So it was very much like very organic. Like I already like talking about this stuff. One thing that I say at the beginning of the podcast, I introduced myself as CPA scorned. So I have a cert, I'm a certified public accountant. I don't do my own taxes. I don't know <laughs> anything about taxes, but I do understand kind of like the the mechanics of business, the plumbing of business. And it helps me explain these topics that are really convoluted and really like purposefully difficult to understand to anybody, even if they have never, you know, opened a business book in their life. Well, but what's so interesting is how you started this off too, but I mean, the plumbing of business, but then like you said earlier, a lot of these like CEOs and stuff, it, like childhood trauma. Like I, I think back to the movie Citizen Kane with Orson Welles and you know, this whole, you know, he's this megalomaniac, you know, this, this guy of great wealth and business. And at the end it's Rosebud was the sled that he used to sled when he was a child. And you see all of this. So as much as it's like the business and the inner workings of numbers and corporations, there is this kind of reality show element 
element that you wouldn't believe, that you would be fascinated with, you guys. And that's why this podcast is so interesting, because behind the scenes, and we saw it a little bit, I guess, on HBO Succession, you know, but it is it can be just like a reality show in the beginning of this week's episode, they cover, uh, they've been covering like Les Moonves and Sumner Redstone and all of these people that will explain who they are. But you said, you know, this is, this is like Scandaval. Some of, I mean, like screw Scandaval. That's like, that's a uh, low hanging fruit. This is the real scandal in corporate America. And it ties into pop culture. Cause a lot of these CEOs, I mean, from Elon Musk now running Twitter or X to uh, Les Moonves, who was head of like Viacom. Right now, there's still a battle for um, Sumner Redstone, his daughter. Like, so I know this is confusing to some of you guys, but can you, I guess, take us through what you guys have been covering this season and maybe into the Sumner Redstone, Les Moonves angle? Yeah, sure. So this season has been a fun one. We started, talk about childhood trauma. We started with this Vince McMahon and the WWE. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here's a guy, you guys that created like a genre, I mean, a genre in a lot of ways or got it to such great heights. And now we see, you know, Vince McMahon right now, it's a billion dollar industry that he is like seen himself out of mm -hmm. because of really horrible behavior. So absolutely. And you, I think for a lot of WWE fans, they can separate from the art from the artist. But where I'm yeah. coming at it from, I'm like, I see the creativity. I see, I mean, he he did. He created something out of nothing, which is we can't say for a lot of the CEOs that we cover on this podcast. However, the wreckage that was left in his wake, I mean, abuse, uh, exploitation, sexual abuse, and a lot of it goes back to his childhood. He had of all the CEOs that we've covered, a lot of them have terrible childhoods. I'd say Vince McMahon is the the worst. I mean, massive tr trigger warning for child abuse, child sexual abuse on this episode. And I always say, like, I think if your net worth is inching towards a billion dollars, mandatory quarter therapy. Like, you, you <laughs> must. Yeah. You must. I'm sure they will go completely willingly. I'm sure Diddy is in ex <laughs> extensive therapy right now. But, I mean, you make this great point because... I mean, I can't imagine even on a low level of reality star fame, people start like being interested in your actual life or caring what you think, how that's got to mess with your mind. But then if you take it a step further with the Kardashians and then into actual CEOs and corporate America and I mean that kind of stuff, you are actually controlling the world in a, in a way. And that's got to really mess with you, especially if you come from nothing. So Vince, and this is so interesting and where I think it ties perfectly. I think the WWE episode, more than many episodes that we do, ties so well to reality television because he basically created an alternate persona for himself that was yeah. separate. And I, I personally, my guess is it has to do with like some kind of complex PS PTSD he was dealing with as a child. So he has Vince McMahon and Mr. McMahon. And Mr. McMahon just kind of has this, this playground in the WWE where he's able to explore all these different fantasies he has all these uh you know power trips that he can go on um and you know what it reminded me of it reminded me a lot of that new york times article with with sandoval where this has <laughs> being on this stage has taken ice cream scoops out of his brain so much that yeah. he doesn't know who is the true sandoval and who is the tom sandoval's and the most extras yeah i would i mean that's that's so G great and interesting. And also I grew up watching WW, I mean, WWF at the time, but like WWE where he was a character, like he was a character in his own show and he continued to be a character in his own show. And already, like I said, most of these people, it does make mush of their brains after a certain time. But I am fascinated that he was also running the business. He was also running the numbers, not just a character on his own playground, but he was behind the scenes making these gigantic moves and what is so tragic about this, and it's all due to his own behavior, his, it, it's, it's the biggest pinnacle that it could possibly be right now. And he is not able to be a part of it. I mean, wasn't he voted off the board and had to like relinquish he, all control? Yeah, he kind of he stepped away and then he came back. He gave uh, the business to his daughter, Stephanie, which was always the plan. And then he ultimately came back and took it over. But after uh, allegations were made by a woman, Janelle Grant, that effectively he was sex trafficking her and other employees in the business, it was finally too much for the board to to swallow. And it's crazy. We talk about the last moon vez. We'll talk about the, the Sumner Redstone of it all. But it is crazy. Despite the fact that these boards of directors are supposedly the fiduciary duty 
uh, have a fiduciary duty to us, the, the, the shareholders, they're really loyal to their CEO or their founder. Um, and they'll let them get away with a whole lot before they'll finally come down with a hammer. And that's exactly what happened with, uh, with Vince McMahon. And eventually I think in the, just in the past year, he's finally sold the rest of his, of his shares. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And a lot of this, it, it, he's running the business and I'm not sure, like psychologically, I always wonder like what his life is like now without this business that he's, got he's, he's still married, he was, right? He's still, he's still married. I mean, it, the, the WrestleMania was the biggest that it's ever been this past year. I can't, and by the way, he looks like a cartoon villain. Now, yeah. whoever talked him into getting that little pencil thin mustache is ridiculous, but it is interesting to think because these men have such egos that this has got to be, like the sky is falling or he thinks that he can get it all back still that he thinks he is power. And I, I, I think about this and I think about Diddy in the same breath in a sense of what are they possibly thinking because their egos got them to this place. So their egos take a blow, but the egos can't be destroyed that easily. So part of me thinks is Vince McMahon still trying to put out feelers for some ultimate comeback, even though he's, you know, very much up there in age. Obviously his personal life has taken a huge hit. I mean, but do you notice when studying these people that it doesn't seem to change their behavior a lot in the end? I would say going further than that, they don't know themselves outside of this company of the, whatever company it is. Like it's not just a company that they work for. Like you and I, well, some people can kind of separate themselves from their work and understand that like I'm a separate person than the, the, the doors, which I go in every day at the office. But for a lot of these people, they have no idea how to separate themselves. Jack Welsh, Bob Iger is a really good example without their company. And a lot of these CEOs, um, who have since oh, retired. Just, just, so you, just wait, yeah. just, uh, just to hold up for the audience. Mm -hmm. Bob Iger, uh, was the head of Dizzy. Then he left and now he came back to kind of steer the ship again into, I guess, more positive numbers. And, uh, Mr. Welch, he was GE. Is that right? GE CEO. And my apologies. I'll do better at providing. Uh, no, no, no. I just want to, yeah. because this stuff is so fascinating. So I want to make sure they know what these people are in yes. control over because that's really like Bob Iger, keys to the kingdom, like Disney, what a power house so all of these but you're saying like there's a lot of similarities between all of these men and that they are so affiliated with this company and corporation that they don't know who they are outside of that absolutely I, I, that's exactly right and it and they really struggle outside once they have to step down because of age or because of most of the time scandal they just throw the Imagine the biggest temper tantrum you could ever throw, but you're also a billionaire. And it's just unfettered kicking and screaming. You know, Bob Iger um, is, is while his uh, supposedly his protege, right? He picked Bob Chapek, who used to run parks to run uh, Disney. And he, and he picked this guy and he says, okay, you're going to be my, my next in command. Same exact story with Jack Welsh. When Jack Welsh retired in the early 2000s, he picked his protege. He said, I, you're, you're perfect for the job. And then what happens? Some of these proteges, they start making normal mistakes, growing pains, whatever. I mean, you can, add, the analysts have a better uh, description than I do, but all of a sudden, rather than these CEOs, rather than coming in and saying, hey, let me help you out, they just start talking shit about these guys <laughs> at Chateau Marmont, at all these places in Beverly Hills and and just being like, yeah, he's a total idiot. I should have done it better. I never should have, you know, and and it's like, do you care about the business or do you really only care about your own legacy, your own legend? Yeah. I mean, they, they will never, I mean, like it, it is interesting because they will never kind of relinquish that ultimate control. I mean, I kind of thought that when I read like about Iger leaving the first time from Disney, I was like, that's not going to go too well because he was so celebrated. He was so heralded. Disney was at like the biggest that it could ever possibly be. And unfortunately, when you take over something that big, there are going to be speed bumps and you have to allow somebody to grow into the role. But, you know, obviously Wall Street and investors have a huge hand in all of this. But Bob Iger, they were like, no, we need Bob back. We need Bob back. And that has got to hit that ego. I mean, I think I remember reading an interview where his wife was very uh, hesitant about that, of why we were starting to actually have a life. Um, why go back to this thing? And, and I think he said he's only going to be here for a couple of years in Disney. Um, he's supposed to retire in 2026. We'll see. But for Vince McMahon, where do you presume he goes from here? Where, like, when these people uh, that have unfettered access and now are being pushed out by their own actions, 
where do they go? Because they've been told yes their whole lives up until this point. For Vince McMahon, it's probably like death. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> the sweet, the sweet release of death <laughs> is, is the, the only <laughs> way see? out. But I mean, we talk about somebody like Les Moonves. So Les Moonves is was the CEO of CBS. Talk about the most powerful man in Hollywood. One of the most powerful men in Hollywood. He had every studio, every actor, every producer, agent, like in his back pocket. He had the LAPD in his back pocket. Yeah, uh, by the way. stories. Oh, gosh. So you guys, Les Moonves started off as kind of an actor in his own right, but like a failed actor, but he kind of like worked his way up. But it was also a lot of luck, a lot of opportunity at the right place, right time. And then, you know, eventually gets to the head of CBS. But then he had a lot of uh, inappropriate relationships, workplace relationships. But yeah, you made a point in your podcast to say, he had LAPD tipping him off, squashing stories. Like he was always like a beat ahead. And this is how, you know, this is how the world works, but also how corporate America works in power. And by the way, just so you know, Les Moonves is still married to Julie Chen Moonves, as she likes to announce. She is the host of Big Brother. And I'm currently reading this book, Cue the Sun by Emily Nussbaum about the history of reality television. And we are now in like the CBS Survivor Big Brother section where, you know, they were talking about that. And also Julie Chen Moonves, after all of these allegations came out about Les Moonves, took this triumphant stand on national television, even though, you know, pro women, all of this stuff. And at the end of the, the sign off, she said, I am Julie Chen Moonves and mm -hmm. kept the last name. Well, you know, so screw women's lib and all of that stuff. Uh, I mean, it was, it was such an interesting pop culture moment. Yeah. First of all, Q the Sun is an incredible uh, name for a book. I have to read well, that. What do you know what the name? The name is from that line in uh, Truman Show when Ed Harris oh, at the yeah. very end is controlling Jim Carrey's like, you know, where he's trying to escape. And he says, Q the Sun and the lights go on in the soundstage. And I thought, oh, that's brilliant. It is. Um, so we talk about where they go from here. So Les Moonves, after he was finally kicked out of CBS, um, after numerous sexual assault allegations, I'm talking dozens and really bad ones. Um, not like which at first, by the way, he lied and said, no, 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 uh, everything's been on the up and up. Uh, I mean, I think there were some inappropriate relationships at my last company, but that doesn't affect this company. There was a lot of excuses made until they kept digging. And the board of directors did a investigation. And for people who are listening on audio, heavy air quotes, they basically just ask him, hey, is there anything we got to worry about? And he's like, huh, let me think. No, I think we're good. Yeah. Well, Didn't ask well, well Les Let, Moonves said we're good, so we must be good. So finally, after the incredible work of Ronan Farrow, who did, I mean, talk about uh, a Nepo baby Pills who's- is, yeah, a Nepo baby that's actually doing good out there. Yeah. 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 Catch and kill. I mean, he's he did incredible work. And finally, after dozens and dozens of stories came out, um, finally the board, the board kicked him out. Now, now Les Moonves has started a production company called Moonrise Unlimited. I think it's somewhere in Studio City. Uh, CBS, by the way, was responsible for paying for his office, uh, for a year out in Studio City after he was kicked out of CBS. But I don't know what he's doing. I don't think he's doing anything except for, um, reports just say that he's kind of, um, what's the word? He's just, waddling around getting really angry that nobody's taking yeah. his call because he's he's effectively excommunicated finally from Hollywood. I mean, like to have that much power and then to have it coincide with the Me Too movement, the Harvey Weinstein, you know, the Weinstein, all of these things is very interesting. And that thought of a, a lonely, uh, upset, you know, multi, multi-millionaire, you know, putting around without power. It's really interesting. And you would wonder like, and you would almost got, I hope they're going to therapy. Oh my God, what a field day your therapist must be having. Because I think a lot of these people feel like they're deserved these, they're owed these indiscretions. Like, listen, I am this powerful. I am, I, I get to do these things. Um, and I read, we both read this book called Unscripted, you guys. I talked about it on the show last year because when I was going back and forth from Arizona, I would listen to the audio book. And it's all about Sumner Redstone and uh, Viacom and CBS. He owned all of these things. And Sumner was the one that kind of, I think, handpicked Les Moonves. But Sumner is interesting as well and a real creepy, weird guy, especially towards the end of his life. 
his daughter, you know, wanted the succession. His daughter wanted to run this. And we're still now currently Paramount has taken a hit, a beating, and they are like multiple offers. Like I think Skydance was going to buy them and they just, uh, that deal went through. And now they're, um, who's the bald, powerful man, Barry Diller. Barry yeah, Diller I mean, is considering <laughs> bu buying Vika. But it is interesting that this all ties together. It's all of these powerful men wrestling control. Is that yes. the overall theme of all of this? Oh my God. Yes. So, I mean, you know, what's so funny about the Barry Diller thing is, and so Sumner Redstone, right. So, so, and I'll, I'll come back to Barry Diller. So Sumner Redstone, uh, also a, a Nepo baby, just like Vince McMahon, also a Nepo baby. We don't really, the uh, kind of lower level Nepo babies, but, um, took over his father's, uh, movie theater chain and yeah. eventually grew it and grew it and realized, Hey, I can make a lot more money producing movies then I can just showing them in theaters. And I, I guess this was when regulations allowed for that, because I think until recently you couldn't be a, a producer and own movie theaters at the same time. But uh, eventually he bought Paramount Pictures and Viacom, and he became one of the biggest media moguls, probably other than Barry Diller, of the 90s, 2000s, created Top Gun, whatever. He was like, you know, big dick in Hollywood. And Bear, there was one point where he was head to head with Barry Diller to buy Blockbuster. And so for our yeah. younger listeners, wouldn't understand why that would be <laughs> such a big deal. But at the turn of the century, it really was. And he massively overpaid for Blockbuster. Every analyst says it. And remember, he's he's a fiduciary of shareholders money, massively overpaying for Blockbuster. Well, why is that? Does he see some value that other people don't see? Does he think there's a good synergy? No. His direct quote was, I don't care how much we pay. I just want to beat Barry. He hated <laughs> Barry Diller so much that he was willing to spend frivolously all this company money. Yeah. Um, Barry I, Diller used to be the CEO of Paramount and they have never really uh, seen eye to eye. And so now it's very ironic that Barry Diller is coming back to potentially buy Paramount. Well, which, by the way, would actually be the ultimate revenge for Barry Diller to buy something that Sumner was very proud of when he was alive. Yes. And, you know, pretty much sell it for parts or try to make it bigger and better under his name. It's really interesting. By the way, Barry Diller also uh, married to Diane von Furstenberg, which is a, a fun little fact. But all of these boys, this boy, billionaire boy club, you know, of CEOs, they all kind of seem to run in this circle. I remember an old story, and I don't know if you guys how far back you go uh, or how, you know, where you're going to go in season five. But uh, I remember being fascinated that when the, when I was a kid, I was such a geek for this stuff. Um, Michael Eisner used to run Disney and uh, David Katzenberg, right? Uh, David Katzenberg was like the underling of Michael Eisner. He was supposedly going to get Michael Eisner's job. He was supposed to be in line for the, the job and the succession. And Michael Eisner didn't give it to him. So Barry, uh, so Katzenberg was livid and then went and with David Geffen and Steven Spielberg created DreamWorks SKG. He said, I'm out. I'm out. I'm going to take my business know-how because he was like this wonderkin like guy that like, like produced like Lion King, like made Disney and cartoons like back, put them back on the map. So Katzenberg teamed up with David Geff Geffen, another billionaire that was at, at odds with Eisner and then Steven Spielberg. And that's how DreamWorks was created. And now DreamWorks has kind of been sold for parts. And in fact, Katzenberg is now selling his final, I think, shares of DreamWorks uh, this year. But it's really interesting how this all, it's all personal. It's all personal. Barry Diller, I think Katzenberg and... I don't remember who else is in it. I could look it up, but they're part of a group called Diller's Killers, which is <laughs> yes, yes. Who, who Barry Diller is, you know, it's his little mentor group, his men's mentor group. Um, but we did a two part episode on Disney and we called it the Disney Drama Kings because that's all it is, is just yeah. infighting between maladapted business boys. Which is so funny in the content that they they produce. It's all about like children and imagination and all of these kind of things. These Teamwork values. and friendship. Yes. <laughs> Which is so funny because Disney now is caught up in these crosshairs of like people trying to go against it because now it's too woke. And so like Iger was like brought back on to try to like kind of squash that down. And it's really interesting. Um, I do notice in talking about all of this, we don't talk about female, female CEOs a lot, you know, like, and I, obviously the obvious, like, do you guys cover, I mean, are there interests? I mean, is it, is it just the battle of the sexes 
it's just that women are way better at this stuff. They're, <laughs> they're more adjusted. They're like, they don't do the infighting. So I'm going to be totally honest with you. We don't, when we look at companies, we don't generally look at like the CEO first. We just kind of see what, what's in the news, what's interesting, what's scandalous. And we start with the juicy stories. And most often those are happening with CEOs that are men. And that's just, that's just how it is. I, you know, the times that we, we end up seeing female CEOs, um, are, is when there's something called the glass cliff. Have you ever heard of the glass cliff? No. What is it? Um, Is it like the glass ceiling? Well, it's, it's a, I guess, a, an offshoot of that. So the glass cliff is what happens when a CEO, a woman CEO is put in power when a company is already in peril. So effectively what happens is they're kind of set up to fail. So I, we saw it, see it in uh, Pacific Gas and Electric and PG&E. We saw it in Under Armour. We saw it in an episode coming out later this season, American Apparel. These are the times that we'll see uh, women getting into the story. The other time we'll see women is they're often communications director. So in Under Armour, um, the CEO, Ken Plank, was having an affair, for example, with Stephanie Rule, who is um, a commentator on M- MSNBC. From MSNBC? Mm-hmm. No shit. Oh, my God. Was <laughs> having an affair on- with Stephanie Rule? Allegedly. Steph- Whoa. Yeah. I just, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Flying her all across the country on the corporate jet. Uh, she was involved in meetings, and she was never working for Under Armour at the time. Um, but the person who is responsible for talking about this scandal to the media is a woman. And she was the only person on the executive board as the, the generally the communications director, um, in the C-suite. And so their responsibility is basically to clean up after everybody else who's, who's made these messes. So, you know, it, it's unfortunately, we're just not in a, in a position yet where we see enough women in the C-suite. Um, and because of that, most of our episodes are about men CEO. CEOs. Well, listen, I mean, it's just boys with their toys. I mean, it really, yeah. unfortunately, the, the stereotype actually fits. Um, you know, you just made me actually think of Linda Yaccarino, who I believe is mm-hmm. like the, isn't she the head of comms over at uh, Elon Musk's X? Ex- she is the CEO of Elon, of Elon, of uh, X. Um, she's Elon's pain sponge, effectively, if we can use the term from, from succession. And you basically, from what I can surmise, and I haven't, we haven't done an episode about Elon Musk, Musk yet. But I do talk about him a lot on um, TikTok. And effectively, from what I understand, is if you're going to work for Elon Musk, you basically just have to kind of sign a blood oath and say everything he does is perfect and just put yourself up on the table and say, I'm going to defend him, even if the things that are coming out of my mouth make no sense, even if they they defy uh, common sense and I make myself look like an idiot and I ruin my own reputation. He has given them so much for whatever reason that they decided it's good to uh to to ruin you know their yeah, their I'll, own legacy. <laughs> I'll always see Linda Yaccarino tweet or like or X or whatever we call it now. And it it, it is like the biggest kiss ass of like this is why X is the best platform that's ever been. Yes. And Elon is a genius. And you're just like, geez, this I mean, are you kidding? Like it is so it's like secondhand, third hand embarrassment, so much cringe. And it's another thing with ego uh, you know, Elon Musk has this huge ego. I was reading that Walter Isaacson biography that was put out last year and it was so, I mean, hysterically funny, you know, is that like this man wants to be a stand up comedian. Like he buys Twitter for a really inflated cost and then really doesn't seem to know what to do with it. But, uh, you know, puts it out there that this is, you know, democratize, like this is the place where you can get your news free. Like the, the obvious things are never answered. And then Linda has to back him up and say, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. To everything. But it reminds me a lot of, and I'm not even talking about, I mean, it reminds me a lot of Trump in a, a lot yes, of ways. Oh, absolutely. I won't get into, I mean, I, I'll, I'll su- summarize my feelings about Elon in saying that I think he's reflective of a crumbling society, but I will say like he, I mean, if you could think about who he is, why would he change his behavior? He's in a situation where every, everything he tries, he gets positive reinforcement about. He, he's, he says, I ha-, he commits securities fraud. He says, I am ready to sell Twitter or I'm ready to sell Tesla at 420 a share. And then he goes to court and ultimately it's, uh, the jury decides that, you know, he's not liable for that. Now I listen to the every single day of that trial. And I can tell you for a fact that it was incredibly complicated for that jury to, to come back with a liable verdict, or I forgot what it is in, in civil court, but for them to find him liable. Then he's he's 
doing God knows what with Tesla and the shareholders give him a $56 billion pay package. So there's a part of it that I think about with a lot of these CEOs in which we have created the scenario for them that they are just getting positive reinforcement. So why would they change their behavior? And so that's part of my podcast. Like part of why I do this is to like open up, you know, give a little sunlight here to be like, the more people understand what is going on here, the more angry they're going to get, the more they're going to try to hold these guys accountable. The more when, you know, you have an opportunity to vote your shares every, every year, if you're a shareholder of a public company, you can vote. No, I don't want the CEO to receive a, you know, uh, I think, What's his face? Uh, Zaslav is making you know fifty seven million dollars. Oh, I don't want. I want. I want to talk about Zaslav in a second. But yeah, yeah. I mean, you get to vote for these things, but that's mm -hmm. why it's so funny because Elon campaigns to get those votes to get his pay package every. I yep. mean, he just did it. I think like la a couple months ago to like fight. He came out there like a ringmaster and like jumping up and down. And then Twitter, you know, like what a what a waste of billions of dollars. But he gets his ego stoked on yep. a massive scale because he has so many sycophants that think of him as this a futuristic hero that anything that he says, any joke that he puts out there, you have just a stream. And by the way, there is no kind of, um, you know, his posts get out to everybody. I don't like Elon Musk, but I see every one of his posts. I don't even follow Elon Musk. I see every one of his posts on Twitter, but he gets this string of sick events like, oh, amazing, amazing, amazing. You need to run for office. You, you know, yeah. he's not an American born citizen, but like, it is really interesting. And there is something to be said that these people like, Dude, dude put himself on the line so many times, you know, to like, if you follow the the course of his career, but also that's not, it's great and it's powerful, but at the same time, it's also like sociopathic. Most of Talk us about, would not do that. Trauma. Yeah. Oh God. It's, I mean, if you read about Elon Musk's dad and even to this day, Elon Musk's dad, you know, had to put him on a, a, you know, still begging for money. And at the same time saying that he's the one that created Elon. I mean, these are real personal pain. If you look at his romantic life, it's fascinating. Um, do you have a favorite CEO, by the way, that you're like, this is actually, I really like the cut of this, the, the cut of their jib. Every year we do like a good episode. Um, so last year we did Chobani. It's, like five, it's five minutes, five, <laughs> six minute episode. It's 140 characters. Um, every, uh, yeah. So last year we did Chobani. Um, uh, and I'm blanking on his name and that's so Wait, embarrassing. Why was Chobani we, good? So Chobani, it's actually really interesting. They, uh, the majority of their workforce is immigrants um, from the Middle East. And they basically, you know, they're they're in an, a town in upstate New York that was really struggling economically. At Hamdi Ukaya, he's from Turkey, um, and so he basically, you know, kind of brought the idea of Greek yogurt to uh, popularize it in America. And he's in upstate New York, um, and then there's also another factory in Idaho Falls in Idaho um, that are struggling economically. And he's like, you know what? There's a lot of uh, immigrants here who would really like a job. I'm happy to provide them a job for them. They get, not only do they get a, a good paying job with health insurance, but they also get like a housing stipend. They get a stipend for, um, uh, they get a stipend for childcare. When uh, Chobani was potentially going public, they were given granted stock to some of these people. It was over a million dollars in stock. Um, so, I mean, I know like it kind of sounds crazy to say like, wow, somebody's treating their employees fairly, like the bar is on the floor, but it's also, it, it makes me feel good to think that, okay, this is still possible. Um, yeah. And then the other one is uh, Costco, of course, which I think is a fan favorite, but the uh, 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 Jelinek, I think is his name. He's a great CEO. Um, and then another one of my favorite CEOs is actually former CEOs is Ted Turner. Um, he yeah, so founded, Ted Turner, you guys created CNN, mm -hmm. uh, owned the Atlanta Braves. I mean, you're really up there. TNT, TBS. He was just so silly, kooky, crazy, innovative. He's the guy that a lot of these CEOs today wish that they were in terms of taking big risks and doing things that other people wouldn't do. And, and, you know, when he bought the Atlanta Braves, he's like at the game every single day, like taking his shirt off and like, you know, just being silly. And I just think there is a lot of like humor and lightness that I wish, like if I had that much money, I would be silly and happy all the time. And it's like, why are we so, there's so much anger in the C-suite and there's so much anger towards, towards workers and towards consumers. And it's like a, a, a little lightness wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. And so that's what I definitely see in Ted Turner. Um, and also his relationship with Jane Fonda is really interesting. I know he was with Jane Fonda for a while. And unfortunately I know he is ill right now, or I believe yeah. he's 
you know, probably in the later stage of his life, but like mm -hmm. he created so many things. I mean, CNN was like a cable stall. I mean, it really started the 24 seven news cycle in a lot of ways. So I don't know if we can fully celebrate him, but I think he meant it in, in, uh, yes. in a good way when he started it, but that, no, those are great examples. Um, I want to move to David Zaslav, who you brought up a second ago. And uh, I, I, I really complain about David Zaslav a lot in this last year and a half or two years. Can you explain to the audience who David Zaslav is? David Zaslav is the CEO of a company called Warner Brothers Discovery. So Warner Brothers Discovery was created when Discovery, of which David Zaslav was the CEO, bought Warner Brothers. Um, he is a corporate lawyer. He's not a producer. He's not a filmmaker. <laughs> he's a corporate lawyer. And when he was at Discovery, the shows that he was responsible for were like 90 Day Fiance, um, one of the other shows uh, on doc, TLC. Doc, Dr. Pimple Popper. Oh, yeah, all Dr. That, yeah. Exactly. Sister Wives, which I love Sister Wives. But, oh, yeah. um, and so then all of a sudden, he's the CEO of this massive film studio, Warner Brothers. And he really had no idea what was really going on at Warner Brothers. There's stories of him going out to Beverly Hills, meeting with Ari Emanuel and Brian Lord, who are two big ta talent agents, I think, with CAA. Um, yeah. And Ari Emanuel actually split off and did Endeavor. Ari Emanuel, Endeavor. you guys, is the basis of Jeremy Piven's character from Entourage. And Brian Lord was CAA, Creative Artists Agency, which are just powerhouse agencies. They have their hand in everything. So David Zaslav's meeting with them and he's asking them, can you explain how residuals work? Because ah. at TLC, he didn't have to pay residuals. Yeah. He, you we know, pay he's them. paying Mama June once for her time and then never again, because they're really churning out kind of low budget content that they can create a bajillion spinoffs with. Um, so a lot of people call Zaslav kind of the Hollywood anti-hero. And to me, he's like the comic book villain of these big media CEOs. Um, his pay package is insane. He's he's the top paid media company, despite the fact that that Warner Brothers Discovery is smaller than a lot of these other companies. Um, he, um, let me. Uh, let me start. No, I mean like Actually, I, I, he really is like for me. The reason why I I passionately dislike this man was he was one of the people responsible for HBO going to Max. So it was like, it went from like HBO Go to HBO to HBO, like to HBO Max and then to just Max. And now this is how confused they are over there. Now they're leaning, they want to go back to more HBO. But that's why when you open your Max app, you will see, you know, t like this amazing programming that HBO had like uh, Succession or even like House of Dragons. But it would now is right next to to Dr. Pimple Popper or my 900 pound wife or all of these things where you're so like, whoa, 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 this is wild. And, you know, to your point, the content on TLC is so easy to produce financially. You have to spend millions and millions and millions per episode on House of Dragons, but you don't have to do that with Mama June. You don't have to do that with Dr. Pimple Popper. So it's disposable. Like you can really, that's why also when you watch these shows, sometimes it feels disposable. It doesn't stick with you. Certain reality shows do, but he's not in the business of making that. He's in the business of shareholders, of making them happy. In fact, Steven Spielberg Spielberg and Paul Thomas Anderson, the filmmakers, had to lobby David Zaslav, go kiss the ring because he wanted to get rid of Turner Classic Movies, you guys, TCM. And they said, no, this is we need Turner Classic Movies. This is a resource for young filmmakers, for people to appreciate the art of film. Martin Scorsese was a part of this as well. And David Zaslav, they had to go kiss his ass yeah, yeah. to get TCM to like continue to like survive. Yeah. He um I mean, he fundamentally doesn't, they didn't hire him because he was a creative filmmaker and really understood taking risks when it came to content. They hired him because he was a corporate lawyer who was good at, at mergers and acquisitions. He actually also worked for Jack Welsh, which Jack Welsh is known as the man who killed capitalism, right? It's always shareholder value maximization above ev everything else. And imagine you are David Zaslav and you are $35 billion in debt because when Discovery bought Warner Brothers, they took out a massive debt. So every month you have like a hundred million dollars that you need to cover. <laughs> and so he'll, he'll be in, in, in interviews. I just read an interview with him yesterday with in the LA times. And it was something like, you know, I've got to take risks and I've really got to be, he's not talking about content risks. He's talking about financial risks. He's talking about, how many people can I lay off 
and yep. still create a passable content. He well, the, the, I mean, the article you're talking about is called Will David Zaslav Help Save Hollywood or Wreck It? This is from the LA Times two days ago. What a headline. But we've seen articles like this for the last couple of years because Zaslav immediately came in and was a one man wrecking crew and was like, you know, like did the the Max deal because more people, uh, you know, felt uh, felt better about Max. That HBO was too stuffy. It was it was too highfalutin. People couldn't handle that. It, we need Max and did all of these cost cutting measures. But the weird part about Zaslav, he does seem to like the power. You see him out like at all of these like functions where he wants to be photographed. He wants his name out there. And that's kind of weird because we are seeing like the ego rise like we did with Les Moonves and all of these people. Do you, so Zaslav last month hired a new communications director. Ah. The prior, uh, if you look at the resume of this communications director, he was the press secretary of the Obama White House. <laughs> Why does a CEO of a media company need a press secretary of the Obama White House? Is it possibly because uh, David Zaslav was booed off stage at the uh, Boston University commencement because he yes, went on talking about, about that. So David Zaslav was famously, I think, the villain of the writer's strike. Um, he was didn't really want to budge at all. Him, similar to Bob Iger, kind of said, your demands are ridiculous. Um, and, and what a picture, because he's on his yacht in his Laura Piano loafers, while most people who are in the Writers Guild and, and the Actors Guild can't even make $47,000, which is enough to, uh, um, which is enough to get health insurance. And a lot of these actors and writers were really struggling to make ends meet. And here are these billionaires telling them, this is ridiculous, right? So he's at, he's at, at Boston University. The next month, he's at, he's at the Cannes Film Festival uh, hosting a party with uh, the guy who's the CEO of Vanity Fair, Gordon something. Um, and, you know, with, with uh, champagne and caviar and like the classic rich idiot party, like, you know, yeah. very uncreative. And someone asked him, you know, hey, don't you think this is a bad look to be hosting this party in the midst of a writer's strike? And he says, I think it's fine. I worked hard for this party. That was his let quote. Them eat, I worked let them hard. eat cake. <laughs> let them eat cake. Yeah. No, I mean, it, but it, that the sense I get, the vibe I get in reading and studying this man is that he does, he does want to be adored. He wants the attention. He likes the limelight. And I think that's a real dangerous thing if you are executing people's livelihoods. I think that's a real weird thing. Like, so, you know, he was hired to do all of these cost cutting measures, but at the same time, I feel like he wants to be a celebrity. I don't feel you can do those at the same time. I don't feel, and th what I try to explain to the audience and, and why I think this is interesting too, if we talk about this in the sense of Vanderpump rules and we talk about the producers there and like, Oh, why don't they like, or why aren't they more concerned or why don't they do the detective work to get to the, they're not at the end of the day trying to make art. They are trying to make a product that they can slap commercials on to get ad revenue. And Vanderpump Rules is the highest ad revenue on Bravo. That's what they're doing. And at the end of the day, it's a job. David Zaslav is not concerned that HBO remains as respected as it once was when like The Sopranos was on. He's there to make the shareholders happy. He's not there to make us happy, you guys. And that's the point that I always try to make is that we can scream about art all day long, but at the end of the day, it's commerce and it's a business. And that's what your whole show is about, right? Or part of it. It, it is, it is. But it's, I mean, it's also like thinking, is there a better way? Like, so, uh, CEOs is there a better way? Is well, there a CEOs way? didn't used to be celebrities until the Reagan era, right? Jack Welsh of GE was really, well, actually, Lee Iacocca of uh, <laughs> Chrysler was really the first celebrity CEO. And now all these cele all these CEOs are celebrities. Why are CEOs on, at the Met Gala? Why are they at the Oscars? Why this, this, this never used to be the case. And I think a lot of people, especially during the writer's strike, thought, well, unions just aren't powerful as they used to be. That might be true, but I also think CEOs' power has has grown exponentially to the fact that they're not even human beings anymore. They have earned themselves to another plane of existence where they don't even have to they don't even have to look at us. They're they're on like this this totally other plane. And I think if if there's a way to bring CEOs down to reality, whether it's reducing their pay packages, whether it's you know increased taxes, whatever it might be, if there's a way to kind of bridge that gap then I think you might just have more CEOs touch grass and you might just have more CEOs as David Zaslav, 
you know, he went out as when the Flash was um, the Flash was a super uh, hero movie oh. with um, what's his Michael face? Keaton came back. I mean, uh, but but uh, the Flash was played um, by uh, Ezra Miller, Ezra Klein, uh, right? Ezra. No, Ezra, 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 Ezra Miller. Ezra, Ezra Miller, Klein's Ezra the New York Times writer. Yes, 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 Ezra sorry. Miller, which was in a string of like really horrible things where they, you know, were accused of kidnapping uh, somebody. Uh, a lot of really, but they also would put hundreds of millions of dollars into this Flash movie, which brought back Michael Keaton's Batman. Mm -hmm. And what were you about to say about it? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it, it flopped in the box office, right? Yeah. And, and Zaslav goes out and says, I've seen it. I think it's the best superhero movie that we've Ever, that not only that we've ever had that's ever been made yeah. <laughs> and it's like that just shows you how unhinged this guy is from reality where the rest of us live yeah uh, in fact uh if you want to see david zaslov uh up close and personal on max i think there is a inside warner brothers docuseries if I'm not mistaken, mm. and he hosts it. He's in the beginning of the episode talking about his favorite films and what's moved him. And at the end of the day, it's just like, I don't trust these people as far as I can throw them when it comes to art. Unfortunately, the commerce part is mixed in there. Um, also, what I mean, in terms of like these CEOs and stuff, we've seen it time and time again when art is involved, they always seem to make horrific decisions. We saw it back in the days when uh, compact discs and they weren't prepared for streaming. They weren't prepared for Napster. They completely, I mean, the reason why artists get paid so little now because of Spotify and Apple music is because they didn't predict, even though they were warned, they didn't predict or see where the business was headed in terms of the music industry. And they didn't suffer. Everybody under them suffered, including the consumer. I think that unfortunately now, like CEOs just aren't paid to make risks. And I think that's never, it's, it's never more apparent than in media right now, because the shareholders are ultimately kind of like older, stodgy. It's like, you know, the, 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 um, it's all, it's, it's a couple of big billionaires. Like John Malone is a big investor in Warner brothers, or you mentioned Barry Diller. I mean, these guys just say what, Whatever decision you can make, make it the least risky and the most profitable. So that often is just layoffs and kind of, I mean, look at how many um, franchise movies that you see in Warner Brothers and Paramount this year. It's all franchises. It's all things that we've already seen before because they say, I know it's going to bring people out to the movies. I know it's going to bring, it's not really risky at all. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, it, we're just past the point of of CEOs being trusted um, to do anything different than that, what they've done before. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting too, on a failing movie business in terms of getting people actually out into the theaters. I mean, that's where there's, they, they, they think it has to be a tentpole film, a sequel, something that you've seen a remake, but those like, you know, the audience suffers because a lot of like upcoming filmmakers that are trying to sell very personal stories, there's really not a place for that. And Netflix, you know, we have so many options to choose from, but you don't usually go for the new thing. You usually go for like the big, like the rock movie or the what, whatever. And it is really scary in, I mean, there was a great book that I read on like uh, Marvel last year on, you know, like Marvel was created and that was like the Marvel studios. And it was interesting. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the guy that uh, runs that, but it was interesting of now, like it started off as this kind of gamble and risk. And now it's part of Disney's, you know, profit margins where they need to make a certain amount yeah. of films. And it's not even that they need to sell the toys. The toys are like the actual thing that you've got to make a movie that has these things in it where we can sell the toys. Yeah. And that affects the overall, like if the movie's good or not, like it's this weird circle. I know. I know everything is it, it's. And then if they, if they do try to do something different and it flops. So at next, next season, we're going to do an episode on, uh, AOL Time Warner, which was a, a massive. Oh my god! That's, Inter, yeah. I mean, Time Warner just has like really been like jostled around, but oh my god, that's going to be so good. Yes, and and the CEO involved in that, I mean, he really took a risk. It didn't work, but he was punished. He was completely ostracized from from business society. And then in retrospect, he was right, right, because he had a, a vision. Um, and give me one second so I can look this up and hopefully yeah. I can, uh, um, because I have so many names. trying to remember what his name was um uh, i want to get it right okay. yeah yeah uh what the heck was his name 
uh, Garrett, uh, Jerry Levin. Um, he had, he, cause he basically predicted streaming and he was like, we need to, this is Time Warner. This is legacy media, AOL internet business. These two need to come together because eventually people are going to watch, get this movies on their computer, <laughs> not even laptop. And he had really predicted it, but the, 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 the business end of it wasn't, didn't hold up. And so, but eventually he was, he was ostracized. Um, like I said, from the business community. And, and I think a lot of CEOs look to that and say, I don't want to turn out like Jerry Levin. I, so I'm just going to stay the course. I'm just going to do, you know, the, the normal thing that everybody expects me to do. And it's really sad. And it's kind of like squash innovation and squash creativity. Um, people are scared because ultimately these CEOs are just really worried about maintaining their own wealth, maintaining their own bank account. Um, well, and, and I, hanging I always, out with celebrities. I always, I mean, the power of celebrity. I always uh, think about or wonder, you know, what would have happened to Steve Jobs if he was alive today? Oh, you cool. know, because here's, if you look at Steve Jobs' history, I mean, this is a man that created Apple, but also then got kicked out of Apple, but then came back triumphantly and just had a string of just hit, pro hit product after hit product, but also was a megalomaniac. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, really pushed people to their breaking points. And I always wonder what would have happened to him because he lived a very, very solid, like a very interesting, simple life, you know, but he was obsessed and Kanye will always say, Oh, so I'm the Steve job of this. And I'm like, Oh, boy, Kanye, give me a break. But I always wonder where Steve jobs, if he would have if he would have held true to all that he believed in, or if that he would have eventually uh, been swayed in some sort of evil manner, or if that was already in the works. I mean, Apple now has Tim Cook, but never like people speak about Steve Jobs still as a, a magician. You know, the magic is gone because we, we put him on such a pedestal. Yeah. Well, and I think Tim Cook uh, adopts that in a little bit. And the fact that he's not, into the celebrity of the CEO, like, uh, like he could be as CEO of Apple. Um, but speak, I mean, speaking of media, we didn't even, we talked about Warner brothers. We talked about Netflix, Paramount, but then we also have Apple TV plus and, and Paramount and, or, and, Amazon well, Prime. I mean, all of these guys are getting into to media. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, but that's what it, it just feels like toys like Bezos, yeah. Amazon Prime. Like, but that's why I always feel like I always make this recurring joke about Apple TV and Amazon Prime. It's like Apple TV, especially they're like, I dare you to find our programming. I don't, we're not going <laughs> to even, we're going to, I dare you to find it. And if somebody like compliments the series, they don't, they don't even seem to care. They're like, yeah, well, cool. Like I always like, are they, are they, are they laundering money through these companies? Because it is so weird. I'll turn on Apple TV and I'll go through the shows and I think half of them are made up. I'm like, wait, that's an actual show? I had no clue. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the way it's going to be in like 10 years with with everything with AI. But um, you should listen to, John Stewart has given a couple interviews since he's been back on a Viacom property, um, uh, Comedy Central. He's given a couple interviews about his experience on Apple TV Plus and how they kind of brought him on and then immediately hamstrung him. And yeah. it's so interesting because obviously he gives an incredible analysis about what it's like to be working for a company that isn't, doesn't care about media, that doesn't care about creativity, that ultimately cares about selling, you know, iPhones and hardware. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, but God, I love John Stewart so much. And if he has problems in the, I mean, like, that's what's interesting. Like, talents like him, he goes, like, he has problems. You would think he would be able to write his own ticket at a certain point, and he has to fight for things. And to bring it back to Paramount, it is interesting because, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, they really, they they kind of got, got rid of a lot of actual content I mean, decades worth of content, daily show clips, MTV, VH1, Viacom got rid of all of this content out of nowhere. And you would think a company would find a clever way to actually sell their back catalog or to make make money off of it, especially when they're complaining about profits, but they get rid of all of it. And it makes no sense to me at all. Did you, you've read about this, right? Yeah, my guess is, I mean, they're getting ready to sell themselves to private equity and yeah. private equity is effectively a house flipper. So they want to make sure that it is as profitable as possible right from the get because private equity is going to come in and gut renovate the whole thing. My guess is the reason that they sold, they either sold or just shut down a lot of those assets is because they're paying residuals. And that basically shows up on your balance sheet as an accounts payable or a debt. So they want to reduce their debt load as much as possible. And that's my guess is they just, they just said, forget it. Let's cut it because I just feel a lot of, 
I, like I just canceled my subscription to Paramount Plus. I was watching it for the challenge. Uh, All Stars, which I love, and also another show, Detroiters, and the Challenge All Stars this year. I it was so low budget, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this used to be a show where they were jumping from semi truck to semi truck, and now the last challenge, they you know when you were in 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 elementary school and they would like hang donuts on a string and you'd have to eat them, <laughs> like that's what they did, but with hot peppers. I was like, what does this cost? Five dollars? I was like, these yeah. are the these, this is the challenge all stars. And I realized they are just slashing budgets left and right as much as they can to make this appealing for a private equity investor who you think this, these CEOs don't care about, um, content. David, uh, David Ellison from Skydance Sky definitely Dance, yeah. doesn't care about content. Well, Dave, oh God, I, I could talk to you for hours because it's, a, this is really like a geek fest because all of these people create all of the stuff that we watch and listen to you guys. David Ellison, Skydance. He also has a daughter, I think Megan Ellison, right? Is that, is that her name? But like, she was, but she was given hundreds of millions of dollars. She produced a lot of really good films because she was given like kind of like this open, like budget from her dad, but none of these film, like, like one or two of the films were actually profitable and she had to be reined in, but she was giving like, you know, if you wondered why some of these like, like Paul Thomas Anderson was getting these big budgets for his films when like, I love Paul Thomas Anderson, but he's never had like a $300 million film ever. But she was giving out these budgets to like auteurs, which was amazing. So they were like, yeah, hell yeah. But like, it didn't like the bottom line, it didn't, it didn't succeed. So we see those things go away. Um, you also, the, the, the residual thing is really fascinating to think about because I, I started off in LA as an actor. And when I started, you know, you could do a commercial and you could make like $50,000 a year on a commercial just because of the residuals, because you had the big three networks and they paid a premium for these commercial spots. But then there was a commercial contract where SAG didn't fight hard enough for. And then it kind of split where cable, they would only pay you every three months. And it wasn't per airing. It was like a buyout for three months on a commercial. Whereas the network would have, to, would have to pay you every time it aired. So the cable thing, you just get a real pittance. And now that's even gone down further where it's really evaporated the middle class of the actor entirely. You either have the Jim Carrey's and the Tom Cruise's, or you have somebody that has to have like two other jobs to be able to even audition to get a commercial or a film or a TV show. Um, but that also, you know, like we talked about the CEOs, they're making record breaking uh, performance packages. Not only that, to these companies, Netflix and Paramount, Netflix has co-CEOs, okay? Ted Sarandos is making $49 million. His uh, co-worker is making, I think, let me see, I have it here, um, $40 million. Um, and then Paramount has three CEOs, Paramount all making no a full business. salary. After, I, I, well, I told you, like I was at that uh, that '90s show premiere last week, and Ted Sarandos, one of the heads of Netflix, walked in. You guys, this guy looked like a million bucks. Like, I mean, uh, it, 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 shoes perfect. His like fancy jeans were perfect. His sports jacket, his hair. He had a driver outside with the engine running. They're all like, because he came in just to say a quick hello. And I was like, this guy. I mean, I mean, you, it really was like power. It was like the Red Seas parting when Ted Sarandos entered the building. And I pointed it out to the Netflix reps. I was like, hey, isn't that Ted Sarandos? Because I geek out about this stuff. And they're like, oh my God, Ted's here. Ted's here. And I was like, wow. Just to watch people just surround this man. And I thought, that's what we talked about. That's the Vince McMahon. That's the... the uh, and Les I'm curious Mooda. to ask you, like, I... <laughs> I actually have never been to LA as an adult, so I've just got. Oh, where do you live? Where do you, where do you Where do you guys do the I show? I live in of? New York City. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So I have seen very few celebrities, but I'd be curious now that you've seen both. Is the energy different if like a Leo DiCaprio walked in? Is, is it? Does it feel different? Leo DiCaprio, he, like I mean, just masses will freak out. Like, ma like you'll mm. see, you know, mother, you know, like somebody. Somebody that wouldn't normally uh, care about anything like movie stars they care about. But like, it's like the type of people that care about Ted Sarandos. You see, like, you're like, oh, this guy actually makes the world go round. Like, you know, DiCaprio is yes, yes. a great it's face like dark for it. This guy. And imagine like, like uh, smoke comes in the room yeah. somehow. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, if that party had like a hundred people in it. 
The 20 people that were there that were really affecting business in Netflix, they knew immediately. The 80 other people there probably wasn't even aware of who he is. And I so, think that's the interesting thing. And you want it, by the way, that's the what that's what you want. You don't want to be a Zaslov where you're hiring a press agent to actually put your name out there. I, I feel like quiet power is the way to go. Well, and that's one of the reasons why we we do our podcast is because I think the only way you can hold these guys accountable is if you could recognize them in a crowd. And I always say, like, imagine if we held David Zaslov or any of or or Sumner Redstone or Les Moonves a sliver as accountable as we held Tom Sandoval for something that was like, you know what I mean? Like, just give me, give me like 1% of that collective energy and just point it in that direction because these are the guys who actually do need to be held accountable. And, and it actually makes a big difference in, in other people's lives when you hold them accountable as opposed to, you know, our collective energy are around Scandoval, which, you know, it was fun, but it didn't, change anything well, because at the end line. of the day San sandoval doesn't really make any kind of anybody's world turn except no. for his band who he pays you know like right. or or schwartz and sandys but these men they control i mean they they control the world in a lot of yeah. ways so those are the people that actually have to be put in power so as we wind down here because i like i said i could tell you got you guys got to come back at some point on season five or something because i mean or, or do some kind of business minute here every couple I would months love because to. i would love I, to i really this is the part that i try to explain to the audience and i know you guys might be a little confused because i it's like a kid in a candy store i get so excited talking about this but you were saying earlier, what power do we, the little people, have because we're there to consume this media, to make our lives better, to disassociate. And it's another thing that like, it's like politics. It's like, wait, I have to like chip in and donate. Like I have to actually pay attention. Like you're supposed to like run the world for me in a good way that I see fit. But now I have to be concerned on a daily basis if you're doing the right thing. How do we do this when it's all focused around media that we should be entertained by? I know it is a real bummer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's not really much I can say other than that. It is a You're bummer. You're like the sweet release of death will happen eventually and you can get out of it that way. Just like <laughs> Vince McMahon. <laughs> exactly. That's so funny. Um, so, I mean, it is a bummer, but I think also you would be able to enjoy it a lot more if you knew that they were doing it the right way, right? So there's a couple of different things you can do. First, you can vote your shares. So if you're a shareholder, for example, if you have any number of, of stocks in Robinhood, every year you're going to get an email from Robinhood that says, hey, it's proxy season. Well, I've never even heard of proxy. What's a proxy? Proxy is effectively a, a business ballot. And on it, you'll see several different things. So you can vote for all the board of directors, whether you want them to stay or not. You can vote for the CEO pay package. So just today, actually, shareholders voted down uh, CEO of uh, Salesforce, Mark Benioff, his pay package. That's Take so that, rare. Salesforce. That never happens. Yeah. So we're going to have to cut the budget for Matthew McConaughey, I'm sure. So <laughs> Yeah, he, he was the spokesperson, right? Yeah. Exactly. So so there's a number of things you can vote on. There's also proposals. So sometimes there's proposals like last year in McDonald's, there was um, uh, like animal rights proposals. So the uh, pigs, you know, the way that they treat pigs in the supply chain, all this stuff. So look out for that email and vote the way you want to vote. Yes, you only have one or two or you know, even a hundred shares. And it's, you know, just like anything voting, you could say your vote doesn't make a difference, but it helps you stay more engaged. And, you know, you deserve to to have that vote. You're investing your money in these in these companies. And then it's just really thoughtful the way thinking about the way you consume. So, you know, it, do you want to buy that thing on Amazon? Do you want to uh, you know, continue to to subscribe to Paramount Plus. For me, I'm just like, I don't know if I want to watch this anymore. Maybe I'll put my my eyeballs somewhere else. And it also helps me kind of like expand into new things that I'm watching. Um, so I think just making sure that you're participating and then just being thoughtful about the w things that you're consuming and the money that you're spending, because ultimately that really is our power, right? And then the last thing is support unions. That I think to me is the 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 thing I get stressed out reading a lot of the things I get stressed out at. And I, you know, I have had to start some therapy because I'm just like, I'm just so bummed yeah. listening to all this stuff. It sucks. But I think the thing that gives me hope is unions and talking about these stuff and like, you know, just rather than getting angry at, at the worker, the, the person at the, you know, at the other side of the checkout line, once you know the name of the CEO of the company that you're frustrated at, get angry at them. You know, talk about them, tweet about them. Um, and I think the more we can kind of build this uh, camaraderie together, I think the the more we can do in terms of like reducing that CEO pay, making them less of celebrities, giving making them more accountable. And that's how we're going to change behavior. 
Uh, speaking of Robin Hood, you also guys did an episode last season on Sam, Sam Bankman Freed, who's currently in jail, who really, yeah. you know, scammed in a lot of ways, even though I think he thought his heart was in the right place. Do do we have to listen to your podcast in order? Like, can no. we listen to it out of order? Like, how do the seasons work? So every season we cover about seven to nine companies on my Instagram. Actually, I have an organized list of like, if you like family dramas, if you like scams and fraud, if you like, you know, I kind of categorize, categorize it. Um, if you like historical, you know, we did, we did Enron, we did kind of older companies. Um, so if you go on my Instagram, one of the pinned posts is going to give you kind of like a nice guide to all the episodes, but each episode is a standalone. Um, and we cover all different types of companies from Disney to, like I said, Under Armour, we've covered Boeing. That was a great episode. Um, McKinsey, you might need to, which, do, you might need to do an update on the Boeing soon. I yeah. know, I know it's, it's crazy. And McKinsey, we did an episode on They're a consulting company that, uh, has consulted for every single company you can imagine, uh, including the Vatican, including, uh, you know, every, everything. Um, big business. And so we really cover it all. And also if you have a company that you'd like to suggest that we cover, you can email me. My email is Becca at nighttoast.com or on the flip side, if you have a cover company that you're like, they're actually doing things right. They're not huge assholes. We also take recommendations for that because that makes me feel good too. Um, yeah. And we love to cover them. No, it would be nice uh, every once in a while to celebrate something rather than rail against it. But, you know, um, uh, yeah, also, and we talked briefly about Les Moonheads, but that's the the most recent episode that I was listening to. And the story really is fascinating, you guys. So you can start there and kind of even dig in deeper because, you know, it really is interesting when you can actually tie a CEO with an entertainment conglomerate to kind of dip your toes in the water because a lot of you are pop culture junkies like I am. Another great thing about their Instagram, you guys, that I was just noticing was that they also had like a, a book recommendation list, which had the book unscripted that I had read, but also some books like Ringside about Vince McMahon that I'm going to add to my re reading list and a couple of other ones that I was like, oh, this is great. I love being recommended uh, new things to read, especially nonfiction books. So that's amazing. Anything else that you would like to, to say to the, oh, by the way, what do you watch? What do you do for full? I mean, do you watch the Vanderpump Rules? Do you? Of course. Well, I actually kind of wanted to ask you about Summer House and what you think about Carl and Lindsay coming back without Danielle. <laughs> I well, I, I think I, I, I mean, we got that news this week and I'm thrilled. I mean, I'm thrilled that they will both be in the same house, even <laughs> though I think that is, you know, ultimately painful and horrible, but it's going to be great for the TV viewer. I am curious what happened with Danielle. Realistically, what happened if she was just asked not to come back? It doesn't make tons of sense. And uh, I'm really I mean, I feel like this is. This is why, you know, even just to relate it to CEOs and stuff is like, I know this is a sell soap, but I just hope that they have some producers on site that are looking to make the best season of reality television ever because they've got so many pieces in like, they've got so many pieces teed up that I think if you don't get something amazing, then you are potentially not doing your job well, because I feel like this is a, a get like, this is an easy season like this, that's. It, everything's in place. That's why I was worried when Danielle said she wasn't going to come back. Cause I was like, Oh no, what does this mean? Does that mean Lindsay's not going to come back? And we immediately got the Lindsay announcement. She was. So I have such high hopes, huh. which is dangerous, but like, you know, it's hard. I feel like sometimes we care about the show more than they care about the show. And at the end of the day, they're just looking to go home to their families potentially. Should I do potentially an, uh, an episode about Danielle as founder CEO? There's a woman CEO. Well, <laughs> you, I mean, you, you could, you could do, Hey, you could do an hour of that. And then the spritzer wars. So that's crazy. And the other thing I don't understand is what is all with these? Why does everybody need a liquor line? Rich people used to become landlords, which Lindsay is actually doing, <laughs> but that's no, what rich yeah. idiots used to do. And now they're all in, in a classically uh, lucrative venture of opening bars and liquor, uh, liquor companies. It must be like, I, it's very interesting. And there must be a lot of just different formulas for spritzes like that they're, you know, <laughs> or just like a hair off. Cause everybody has one. I mean, I know even like some podcasters that have them and I'm like, listen, I love podcasting, but I don't think I would ever, like, I hope I never eat my words. I don't think I would ever put my name on any kind of spritzer. I mean, <laughs> I just like, yeah. Hey man, I'm a middle-aged dude. Trust me on what I drink. Like I sit behind a microphone all day. Um, but it is, uh, and now you got me thinking about Lindsay. Cause you're talking about the Airbnb she owns yes. in Nashville. Now it'd be great if Lindsay eventually becomes a slumlord, you know, <laughs> like she just be like, ah, oh, this lady, she's my, she's horrible, but no, I, I mean, you could do a whole episode on, I mean, you could do a whole episode on just 
CEOs of reality show products. I mean, you could date yeah. it back oh to like, you know, Turtle Time with Ramona, whatever happened to her Pinot Grigio. And to, I mean, Beth, okay, Bethany Frankel, uh, Frankel of all people. I mean, there's so many. So you watch all of the Bravo shows, yes, right? All, all, everything, all of it. Yes. Um, and a lot of the TLC crap too. Um, ever since COVID, you know, I've really struggled with honestly consuming new content. So a lot of the content I watch is just repeat. I probably watch Vanderpump Rules every week. I probably watch a couple episodes from the old season. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just uh, yeah, reading all these business books, I need to kind of just turn off my brain. So it's all mostly, I'm a massive Vanderpump Rules fan and massive. Is uh, there anybody I'm in Bravo fan. that you respect in terms of business? Oh my God. Wait, I went to, to watch what happens live and we got to ask a question and I wasn't able to ask, but I did want to ask Andy if you could have any, um, if you could have any housewife prepare your taxes, who would you trust? <laughs> Um, yeah, I was there. I was there like six or seven months. I forgot when I was there watching and I got to ask a question of Andy beforehand. And I said, which, uh, which housewives were you texting with over the weekend? And he's shy. He said, he said, uh, he brought up Kelly Dodd. I was like, Kelly Dodd, Kelly Dodd. you were texting huh. with Kelly Dodd over the weekend. But I was like, you got to stop giving your number out to these people. Yeah. Um, do I respect anybody business wise? Um, why the ne the name that comes to mind is Sonia Morgan, but I just feel like she oh. just did everything with such vigor oh. Oh and like with God. her whole heart, and she really cared about the toaster, and she really cared about the the line. Back, of back way back, <laughs> you've just lost all credibility at the end of the episode. You literally, I mean, literally, people were literally turning over to your podcast right now. To, I love Sonia Morgan, but there is no way that that could be your answer. The toaster line without a toaster? Are you yeah. kidding me? But she just wanted it so bad, and you but, know. But what? it didn't I, happen. It didn't, I, I, but she didn't make it happen. She could have just sold the box. I would have bought the box without the toaster because <laughs> it was like she had the image out there. To me, that is the worst person to choose because she she always <laughs> missed that final step. I mean, she she let her, her 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 house go at auction for way less than it was actually worth just a couple weeks ago. That's because she does business with her heart. You know, and <laughs> so by the way, maybe okay, maybe in the when we sell another good episode in your in yeah. your podcast, that's who we celebrate. Okay, well, this was fantastic. I hope you guys love this as much as I do. The podcast once again is called Corporate Gossip Podcast. We go, we subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We rate it five stars because that really helps, especially on something that you want to get out there. You want to get the message out there, and that's why she's here today. Um, she does host it with her brother, so he's involved as well. Um, and I just have nothing but uh, great things to say about it. So Becca Platsky, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Ryan. This was awesome.